And I don't have the little clicker, but that's OK. We'll improvise. OK. So to begin, we really need to reframe. My colleague Rosie was saying, you know, we don't always have to think about behavior as good or bad or inappropriate or appropriate. One thing we have to remember when we're talking about behavior is we're not always talking about problem behavior. Behavior is anything we do or say, right? So walking, talking, eating, sleeping, reading. Reading is behavior. And I say this because when we talk about using behavior analysis or, or some of these different um, approaches, sometimes we really only think children who have problem active, acting out type behaviors can benefit from it. And it's really not true. The other thing about behaviors that we want to look at is some are innate, some we're born with, but there's very few of those, right? Nobody taught us to breathe, right? Nobody's prompting us to breathe. Um, sucking is something we come out of the womb with. Everything else we do as human beings is learned. That's important. Because often when we're coming across um, children with autism or, or anybody really with problem behavior, sometimes we hear or we say things like, that's just learned behavior. They've been taught to do that. Well, that's true of all of us, right? And the other point that I really wanted to remind ourselves when we're thinking about this is when we talk about behavior intervention, we're talking about human behavior. So it's not just behavior of children with autism or adults with autism or anybody with any other kind of labeling. What we're talking about here is human behavior. So it's true of all of us and all of the people that we encounter. So that's a really important point to think about. We continue to do what we do or we stop doing what we do based on how it works for us in our environments that we live in. Okay, so all behavior. No matter how complex behavior can be, it's also incredibly simple because we can boil behavior to certain functions, right? And generally, we can look at anything we do or say, and it will fall into one of these four functions of behavior. Okay? Um, sometimes we say that behavior happens for no reason or out of the blue, and that's never really true. Sometimes we just have to be better detectives in finding out why things happen, which is why we're talking a little bit more about this right now. So for some of us, this will be a little bit of a refresher. And for some of this might be really new information. Okay. So the functions of the behavior, why do we do anything that we do? The first one is to meet some kind of sensory need. Right. Sometimes you may also see this as called automatic reinforcement. Um, so if I, if I have a itch on my arm, right? You can't see that there's an itch in my arm. All you can see me is scratching it. We've had that shared experience. You've had an itch on your arm before and you've scratched it. So if I'm up here scratching, you're like, oh, she has an itch on her arm. There was a sensory function for me doing that itch. You recognize that behavior because you've used it. There might be other ways that are a little bit more peculiar way of meeting a sensory need, right? Um, some of the more common ones we might see are our children that rock, right? So the rocking can meet, be meeting some kind of self-regulation need or some kind of sensory need, right? Um, for our kids who, who can do a little bit of flapping, that might be a sensory need. The second one is escape. We could say escape or avoidance, right? Because sometimes we do things because we want to get the heck out of something or make something go away. Sometimes we just want to delay the inevitable, right? At home, the first thing we might think of is getting ready for bed, right? Our children who don't want to get ready for bed, bed will happen, but I have a whole list of bags in my trick to make sure it happens a lot later than we, you were anticipating it, right? So that's a really, really important one. Um, attention. So a function of gaining attention to myself. You're not paying attention to me, and I need you to. That's a biggie, isn't it? That's a real big function of, of a lot of our behaviors. Where we have to be very careful here is that we often dismiss a function of behavior as they're just doing that for attention, right? And that can sometimes really belittle a situation or a behavior or a child and what they're looking for because sometimes I just need to gain your attention 
because I can't reach my favorite toy on the shelf, right? Um, some things I need another human being to pay attention to me to help me to the next step. So when we're thinking about functions of behavior, we want to be careful that if we're looking for attention, is it because I'm looking for social engagement, right? Um, this is important because we'll talk later about replacing behaviors that have to meet the same function. So if I'm told I do something for attention, um, if I do something silly or unexpected for attention, and then i have taught a new way to gain attention, but really what I wanted was social engagement, then I'm going to go back to that problem behavior as soon as you turn away. I didn't just want you to look at me. I wanted to have an interaction with you. Or I didn't want you to just look at me. I wanted you to go grab the iPad that's locked up in the, <laughs> the cabinet, right? So that's an important thing to remember. And the last one is the tangible. Something, an activity, or an object that I want access to that wasn't previously there before I do the behavior. So four things, four things, four reasons. Can I do one behavior and have multiple functions? Sure, sure. But what this really helps us do, if you notice, there's no function of behavior that says autism. I don't do something because I have autism, right? Um, I don't do something because I'm a woman. <laughs> Um, I don't do something because I'm six, right? There's functions to my behavior that are really more important to really get to know who I am and, and why I do what I do. Okay. Where's my clicker? Okay. Okay, so some teachers may groan just by seeing that on top. Um, the ABCs of behavior, they're important. Um, so when we recommend that we take ABC data, which is what, what this is based on, it's not just because we think teachers have to um, or have the time to journal about their children or really want to just sit down and make notes in between teaching at all. This really is what tells us all we need to know or the beginnings of what we really need to know of why behavior happens. This is what tells me. So we spend a lot of time looking at behavior and hopefully explaining behavior or being confused by behavior. And what we really need to be learning is to be objective and step back and to learn to see what's happening all around the behavior. So when we're looking at ABC data, ABCs of behavior, we're saying that a behavior happens. Something happens before it. Something happened in my world that triggered that behavior. We call it in this an antecedent. You can call it before the behavior. You can call it whatever you want. But an antecedent is something that is now in my day, in my world, in my room, that didn't exist before. OK? The consequence is what happened immediately after the behavior. Right? Before I did something, it wasn't there. Afterwards, it was. There was a change in my environment. Why is this important? Why do I need to know this? I'll tell you. If I start to learn the antecedents, I'm writing my ABC data, right? So if my behavior is um, hitting, right? And so I'm writing hitting right down there. And the antecedents, I'm writing everything that happened right before that behavior. What do I start to notice? I start to notice patterns, right? Triggers. And what happens when I start to know when a behavior happens? What can I do? You're right. We can teach. There's options. Most, almost 90% of my options in changing behavior happen on this side, right? Once it's happening, I'm reacting. Powerful, too. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But this helps us start to identify those triggers, right? Now, this isn't actually that simple, because the antecedent is really something that happened close to when the behavior occurred. So an antecedent wouldn't be mom's on vacation, right? Um, antecedent is, I'm a student who normally has a daily medication, but I forgot it, right? That's something we call a setting event. If you want to think about it, like that sets the stage that if something comes into my world later, I might be more likely to hit, if that's the behavior I'm looking at, but it's not the antecedent. So substitute teachers is a biggie, right? Substitute, when we're, we have we been substitutes, we know, or when we're teachers, that we know that the, we just don't have the same level of structure and predictability because we're different human beings running the show. 
So I, it can be a substitute teacher day, and that might get me very upset as a student. But if somebody says, put the iPad in front of me, am I likely to hit if I love the iPad? No. If somebody says, today's the day we write a five paragraph essay in front of me, right. So my behavior was actually triggered by that five paragraph essay, right? As opposed to, this is the day that I didn't get any sleep or I didn't eat breakfast, or um, my aunt dropped me off instead of mom. So that's really important to think about, because those are the types of things we can change, right? Then when we hop on the other side, we're writing consequences. We have to rethink some of the terminology, and consequence doesn't mean punishment or what happened, right? It's not a reprimand per se. It can be. But when we're talking about consequences, we're talking about, after I did this behavior, what happened immediately after? What did I influence? It may be teacher reprimanded. It might be peer cried. It might be the five paragraph essay went in the garbage, right, by the substitute teacher. So it's really important. When we look down that, that C column, what are we looking for? What do we start to notice? Yeah, we see the patterns. We start to see the functions behind the behavior, right? And we write it down. We can, get, we can get better. We don't have to have the fanciest sheets. We don't have to have the most pristine language. We just have to have a shared understanding of what we're looking for and how we're recording it so it means the same for us. So don't be fearful when the ABC data comes out. Um, I, I, we acknowledge that some of this can feel time consuming, but know the power behind this type of knowledge and how difficult it is to remember this at the end of the day. Okay, it's really hard to remember what happened from 12 to 2 at 6 o'clock, right? It's really, really hard. Now let's see if I get good at this. Okay, so now this is just a fun little example. Hopefully the volume's not on too loud on this one. Um, we'll say that back there. So we were just going to take a look at this quick little video um, of a little toddler having his moment. And just take a look at what the toddler does, what the parents do, and then just see if you can get an idea of what a function might be. Oh, well, let's try that again. This is why I have my behavior assistant people on the stage right. That's you. So did I. Well, it takes Rosie's touch. Okay. Now, clearly, we're not going through the most scientific approach of determining the function of the behavior in that, but let's face it, many times, this is what we're going on, right? What is the logical function of that little child's tantrum? Well, first of all, what was the behavior? Crying, right? Falling, crying. Um, what if I called it a tantrum? Does that mean the same to you as it does to me? Right? Some parents with, autism, with children with autism might, might say that there's a bit of a different um, spin to it, right? I might call a tantrum my kid threw on the floor and I just scoop them up and then we walked out. Other people might call a tantrum 15 minutes of screaming, throwing chairs, right? So what was the behavior? Crying, falling on the floor, right? Absolutely. What was the likely purpose of this for this little guy? What's that? It might be a good time, <laughs> yeah. Of our seat, of our sensory escape, attention, tangible, just based on what we saw. Likely attention. Why not escape? Because he kept following, right? We know escape behavior pretty well because when we go away, it tends to stop, right? 
So it's just, it's a fun, it's a silly example, but it is, it's a really fun one for sure. What else could it be? What do we say about attention? How big is this little guy? Yeah. Maybe mom just turned the TV off <laughs> and he needs her to go turn it back on, right? Maybe I wasn't done pleading my case. But certainly it was to gain attention or access to that caregiver, 100%. This is so easy when we're sitting, and I say this of all of us, when we're sitting in an audience watching something like this, it's trickier to check ourselves when we're, when we're giving attention to negative behaviors and recognizing that we're giving exactly what the behavior is asking for. That's tricky, right? That's tricky. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So the consequences, the other side of it, those functions of the behaviors, right? There's only two, well, there's a neutral two, but real, two real consequences that maintain behavior, okay? The likelihood of something happening again or not happening again. The, language, the terminology for that is reinforcement and punishment. Again, we have to step out of our minds of what reinforcement and punishment really means, right? Um, sometimes we think reinforcement and reward is interchangeable. In a way, it is, but reinforcement's more powerful than that. Because reinforcement is anything that happens after a behavior that makes it more likely to happen again. Anything that happens after a behavior that makes it more likely to happen again. That means I don't know if something's a reinforcement until I see how it impacts the behavior, right? If I punish a behavior, then it makes it less likely to happen in the future. That's the impact that it has on behavior, OK? So sometimes we think we could be punishing behavior, but we're really reinforcing it. Sometimes we can be reinforcing behavior and thinking we're punishing it, right? Um, I've given some different examples before. You know, There's some things that we think all children love. We think all children love praise, right? Most do. It's a good go-to. We should be praising and and showing pride towards um, our students and our children that are doing well. But some children don't really love the exuberance that go with our expressions, do they? If I walk up to a child, I'm shot, you know, they just did something wonderful, and I'm like, that is the best thing I've ever seen. I've never seen you do that. And I'm shouting. And that's aversive to the child. Have I really rewarded or reinforced that child? No, it actually turns a little bit more of a punishment, right? So we always have to be a little bit mindful of how is our, what we're doing to respond to a behavior, how is it impacting the behavior? Because that's what's most important, okay? So let's look at that. Oh my goodness, I should have practiced this probably. Ah, nope, otherwise, sorry guys. Okay, so pop quiz. What is the difference between bribery and reinforcement? Uh-huh. Ten. Say that again. Thank you. Past tense, pretense, when you give them the modifier. The when, right? Bribery is what I do to say, I'm going to give you this, but you better be good on the plane, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? I'm going to take you for ice cream, and then you're going to sit on the potty when you get home, right? It's something we do. It might work, right? It might work, but it's really not the same thing. And it tends to be luck at times, right, that it's gone. Reinforcement is something that happens after a behavior and is contingent on that behavior. If that behavior doesn't occur, then the reinforcement does not happen. Okay? That's really important, especially when we take all of this knowledge and this wisdom and we're sharing with others that we're working with. Sometimes it can be really hard sell to say, I'm going to be introducing a reinforcer because the child's not responding to praise, right? The natural reinforcement that exists in his or her world is not powerful enough. I'm going to be introducing one. And sometimes we have our colleagues that will say, well, that's not fair. And I'm holding the same expectations for other people. Or I'm not going to bribe them to do their work, right? So it's really important because all of us can be quick to feel like that, especially when we hold high expectations for our students. Right? Our first instinct might be, mm -mm, no, they, they can do it. So it's really important to remember in our minds that bribery and reinforcement are very, very different things that we're looking at. Okay. 
Is this child being punished? Trick question. Depends on the child. No. What's happening here? We can all label what this would be, right? Well, he's in timeout, right? Timeouts are very, very common. He's getting the mom's attention. Absolutely. It doesn't look like he's paying attention to one there, right? It doesn't look too put out by it either, right? Yeah, trick question. We don't know whether this child is being punished, right? We don't know unless this makes it less, whatever this little guy did, maybe he's our tantruming guy. I don't know. Let's say it was our tantruming guy. Let's, let's, let's quit. Let's visit that in a minute. But we don't know until we know how this has impacted that child's behavior. That's a really important thing to do because timeout, even if we don't call it timeout in the older grades, it happens in our classrooms all the time. Go back to your desk until you're ready to join the class. You can go sit that out in the hallway. When you're done, you'll be able to join us. Let me know when, right? We do a lot of those things. If we really called it by its whole name, we might remember. It's actually called time out from reinforcement. That's what that means. It means there's something you're being reinforced by, and because your behavior isn't where it's supposed to be or it's what's expected, you're removed from that reinforcement until you're doing the appropriate behavior. So if this was our little tantruming guy that was chasing me around the house while I was cooking because he needed my attention, and I said, we don't yell and cry in our house. It's dinner time. I'm not going to stop dinner every time you cry. Come on over to time out. What did I say about time? You know, what did I say about crying? We don't stop what we're doing. We do this all the time, right? Or at the teacher. Don't call out. I'm not going to pay attention when you say the answer out loud. You have to raise your hand or I'm not going to acknowledge you. We do it all the time, right? So it's not time out. It's time in, right? That, that behavior absolutely worked. That is not to say that time out isn't a wonderful procedure of being able to step out of a situation in which I don't have control, regroup, and come back. We just have to be mindful in how we're using it, right? We also have a tendency to leave our kids in time out. We can't help it. We either have a, a, a we're cooking dinner or we have a house full of kids, right? So we also have to remember that that is a structured time as well. Ah. Is chocolate reinforcement? <laughs> yeah. yeah, good, because we have a whole bunch of it outside on the table on your way out. Yeah. It's a, <laughs> up front, it's absolutely yes, right? Right. Trick question again, right? How do we know if something's being punished or reinforced? Exactly. How does it impact the behavior moving forward? That's the kind of stuff that we have to look at. Let's say we love chocolate in the front row. But maybe they were chatting at the table where we laid about 100 pieces of chocolate <laughs> out there, and you just had about 10 pieces on the way in. And then I say, if you come up here and you do a little dance with me, I'm going to give you a piece of chocolate. Would that be reinforcing? Probably not so much. Probably not so much. So no, we do have to look at how does it impact behavior. We also have to think, do I like chocolate? Not all kids love stickers, right? Most do. <laughs> Most do. Um, not all people love chocolate, but even if I love chocolate, I like it under certain conditions, right? right? So it might impact my behavior next time. It might not. Okay. So one more quick video to illustrate what we're talking about. Another fun example of positive reinforcement. Ah, I have to back up on that because I feel I'd go home and I'd say, you know what I forgot to say? that there's different kinds of reinforcement and punishment. Because positive reinforcement, we talk about it everywhere. It's incredibly important. We're adding something positive to make something more likely. What we forget is reinforcement's also negative. You know, if you're working independently, I walk away. That's negative reinforcement. You don't need me. You do that alone with your friend, right? Um, you get five problems problems done, the worksheet goes away. That's negative reinforcement because I'm more likely to do my writing next time or my math next time because something goes away after I do it, right? If I cover my ears and I block off the fire alarm, that, that makes it go away. I'm more likely to cover my ears if it works, right? Same with punishment, right? Positive punishment, something's added to my world, right? 15 minutes after class, all of that, to make it less likely for her to do something. Or something's taken away, negative punishment, right? I have no more iPad after school because I, you know, I didn't do my homework. 
that's important stuff because reinforcement doesn't always mean we're creating and adding something. And punishment doesn't mean we're always taking something away. Whew, almost forgot that. So this is an example of positive... <laughs> What's this cartoon called again? Oshikuru Demon Samurai. And it's not a cartoon, it's anime. Anime. You know, I knew a girl in high school named Anime. Anime Fletcher. She was born with one nostril. Then she had this bad nose job and basically wound up with three. You're here a lot now. Oh, am I talking too much? I'm sorry. Zip. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chocolate? Yes, please. Oh, hey, Kim. Yeah, I... you know what? Hold on. Let me take this in the hall. <laughs> You'll never guess who they got to replace you at work. Okay. I know what you're doing. Really? Yes. You're using chocolates as positive reinforcement for what you consider correct behavior. <laughs> Very good. Chocolate? No, I don't Sheldon, you can't train my girlfriend like a lab rat. Actually, it turns out I can. Well, you shouldn't. There's just no pleasing you, is there, Leonard? You weren't happy with my previous approach to dealing with her, so I decided to employ operant conditioning techniques, building on the works of Thorndike and B.F. Skinner. Yet by this time next week, I believe I can have her jumping out of a pool, balancing a beach ball on her nose. No. This has to stop now. I'm not suggesting we really make her jump out of a pool. I thought the bazinga was implied. I'm just tweaking her personality. You're sanding off the rough edges, if you will. No, you're not sanding Penny. Are you saying that I am forbidden from applying a harmless, scientifically valid protocol that will make our lives better? Yes, you're forbidden. Bad, Leonard. Okay. So, good stuff. Never, never gets old, absolutely. Um, so, one thing that we always have to say moving off from that is we, we reinforce behavior. We are in charge of creating new behavior, encouraging new behavior, or discouraging some behavior. And we're always careful, because we are applying scientific principles that work that we're always doing it in meaningful, meaningful, ethical, and in ways that are really benefiting the direct child we work with, right? So that might mean that we're not always reinforcing the behavior that makes it less disruptive for my classroom, although there's a power in that, right? Children have to learn how to be part of certain settings, but to be really careful and mindful of that as well. I would like to say that when we end because I feel bad ending on the, um, the seal thing or the jumping out of the pool thing when we're talking about children. Okay, so here, is probably one of the biggest things that we built up for, right? And that's replacement behaviors, okay? The, one of the main reasons why we need to understand the function or the purpose of why a student does a behavior is because if we're going to make that behavior go away, if it's a problem behavior, we need to know what we want that child doing or that adult doing instead, right? There's a reason why we're not crying to our parents anymore, right? We all started that way. We all started crying for milk, right? When did we stop crying for milk? When we could get it ourselves, absolutely. When we had the independent skill to do it ourselves. Or when we were taught another way to access it, right? For those, for those of us who have language we were able to start asking for it. Which one's easier, to say milk or to throw a tantrum like that little guy? It's actually easier to say milk and get what I want because it's less effort, right? 
So whenever we're looking at a problem behavior, we've said it so many times during this presentation, we'll say it again, it's a communication of a skill deficit over and over again. If I could do something differently that made me um, more of a participant in the environment I'm in or got it quicker, I would do it. I would do it, but I have to be taught it. The other thing is, if you're going to take a behavior away from me and I'm going to stop doing something, ethically, I need to have something in that place. That's my tool. That's my tool for getting my needs met. Even if my needs met means you need to walk away from me as a teacher. I still need another tool to be able to protest something or request something. So not only ethically do we want to make sure we're teaching a replacement behavior whenever we take one of those skills away from a child or those tools away from the child, we're also not going to have any success unless we teach a replacement behavior. Because if I can't say the word milk, I'm certainly going to go back to crying, right? And if you don't tell me what I'm going to do instead and I no longer can do that, I'll come up with my own, right? And when I come up with my own replacement behavior, hmm. I tend to go from crying to hitting, don't I? It's a little bit more effective. It works almost every single time, <laughs> right? Um, particularly in public schools. How hard is it to manage escape behaviors in public school settings, right? You, you have some limited. We really have to work on what would, do we want to replace escape behaviors in a way that we're able to control that escape a little bit. Because if you throw a chair, you're likely going to get out of a writing assignment in a second grade general education classroom, right? Um, if you run away on the playground, you're, you're escaping the line back in. These, this, there's, there's some very real behaviors that we're talking about. So replacement behaviors, as soon as we identify a problem behavior and we say, well, I want this to go away, our first thing is, what do I want him to do or her to do instead? Right? And here's the kicker. I don't know what they need to do instead unless I truly understand the function of their behavior. Right? So if I'm going to take away coffee drinking, <laughs> yeah, right? See, these things are tough. If I'm going to take away coffee drinking and I drink it for the caffeine, would decaf coffee be an okay replacement behavior? Hmm, not so much. It wouldn't be meeting the same function. If I drank coffee in the morning because I wake up in Massachusetts and it's a freezing cold drive to work, this is a true story, that's when I started drinking coffee, would a replacement behavior be decaf coffee? Sure, there can be a, a function of that. Right? So we really need to make sure that it matches the same function as the child's problem behavior, or we're just, it's not going to work. Okay? So when we're doing re uh, replacement behaviors, we also have to recruit others. Our team, the people in the hallway, it's tricky. This isn't easy at all. Um, none of the stuff we're talking about. It seems and it sounds easy when we're talking about it because it's logical, but we're talking about humans, right? So when we talk about behavior analysis, we're talking about applied behavioral analysis. We're analyzing behavior so that we can apply it. And we're applying it in settings, not laboratories. And we're applying it on children and adults, right? Not rats. So it's a little bit messier. We need a team of people to be able to control the environment enough to be teaching some of these skills. So make sure we are able to get as many people on board as possible. Okay, so all of that is, comes down to what we need to be doing, and that is defining behavior and teaching it, right? We need to know what it is, what is behavior, what does it look and sound like, and how am I going to teach that? Because if a child could do it, they would do it. Okay, so the first one, the first indicator under that is D1. Expectations and rules are clearly defined, positively stated, and visually posted. Basically, this is what I need to know. If I am the speech pathologist, or I am an inclusion support person, and I walk into your classroom, do I know what the expected behavior is, or do I just know what you don't want somebody doing? No talking, right? That's really important. Would I know the child's doing it or not doing it? That's how closely we need to define that, because if I can't recognize it, then the child's not likely to understand exactly what's expected either. The other thing is the positively stated. We don't say no hitting, no kicking, no pushing. If we think about what our, our brain responses are as visual thinkers, right? If you tell me, don't run, what's the first thing I'm picturing? Running, right? 
If you say, walk slowly, what's the first thing I'm picturing? <laughs> walk slowly. So there's really a response and thinking that we're setting into um, effect there. That's really important. Expectations and rules are explicitly identified, taught, and proactively practiced on a daily basis. So when we're talking about behavior or an expectation, we really can't go beyond just say, stating what we want and providing a little bit of a rationale behind it. If everybody's calling out that I'm never going to get through this lesson, it's rude, right? That's kind of the ways that we can kind of approach it in just a more general way. What this indicator is saying is that I, there's an expected way to act. I'm saying in very specific terms what it looks and sounds like. Anybody who comes into my classroom will know whether we're doing it or not doing it. I've also taught how that looks and sounds. I've done role plays. I've created social stories. I have a video model on the iPad that the child's looking at to know what does sitting at circle time look like? What does transitioning between classes look like, right? What does walking in or out of a room safely look like? Behavior management strategies emphasize positive antecedent-based approaches and the minimizing and or prevention of behavior problems. Okay, so the antecedent, right? What am I doing to change my environment in the instructions that I give, in the classroom design of what I do, in the material as I use to make the behavior less likely to be triggered, right? So I'm not just saying, like uh, Dr. McGravy was saying at our summer academy, we're not going to say we don't use the word no, because if we say the word no, the child goes off. It's not that we're going to put out all fire so that the child never is triggered. It's just that if there's a trigger, if I know that writing is always going to be a trigger, then I'm going to be thinking about whether I'm going to be introducing that task in a way that is either more digestible to the child, visually more appealing to the child. I have my, all of my options are in that antecedent phase. So when we're making behavior plans or we're looking at that, these are incredibly important things that we're looking at. How am I changing the way I say something or present it or arrange something before a behavior is likely to happen? A word on the break card. Okay. Break cards are some of our best efforts <laughs> in controlling escape, right? It is a replacement behavior, right? We're not able to always, when we're in an anxious state, or an escalated state, we're not always able to verbalize, I need out of here, right? Some of us don't have that language. So this is a common one that we introduce, right? To say, oh, I need a break. And it gets out of it a little bit. It's problematic, isn't it? It is. And not just because what most people say is, you can't tell me to go away. Well, guess what? You are going to go away, because when I hit you, you're going to go away. I'm giving as much power over this in an antecedent way as possible and replacing it with something slightly more appropriate, right? With the break card. Where we go wrong with this, um, number one, is first of all, fading it out. And number two is we're not structuring what that break is. What we're really teaching is self-regulation, right? We're teaching stop. There's space between something that just happened and what you're about to do. We're putting space between that, right? We talk about our impulsive children. Well, they'll say it's impulsivity. And some of that's true. It's like you have like a split second to get between that. We're also teaching that you step away from something and come back. What we can probably get better at is what do we naturally do for breaks when we want somebody to go away or when it's too hard to listen to me for right now, right? You have the right to go out and get a drink of water to visit the restroom. Maybe you're not as thirsty <laughs> as it looks, but you know that walking out and getting a drink of water is one way to be able to walk back, come back, and orient yourself. So I think that what we could get better at is building some of that into it and making break a little bit more structured or meaningful or built into natural routines in a way. The teacher tip on the side is important. It says schedule non-contingent reinforcement. That's the terminology out there. All that means is if I know I have students that are going to give me behaviors for attention, that I want to satiate them with attention before the behavior happens as much as I possibly can. How hard is that? Number one. Sometimes it's identifying the times of day where it's likely to happen. Um, maybe it's right before a group discussion, whichever it is. And as a teacher, I know that I have to give it non-contingent. Nothing happened. I'm giving it up front. I'm careful not to give it after problem behavior. I'm giving it up front. I'm uploading. I'm making you less hungry for whatever it is that you are going for. Does that make sense? 
The hard part about that is remembering, particularly if you're one teacher. I mean, sometimes we have to put ourselves on our own self-monitoring, setting timers for ourselves, reminders, those kinds of things so that we're doing those kinds of things. Same with the escape. If I have a child that's always going to escape a four-hour block in the afternoon, then I have to start thinking where are the breaks built in that makes it less likely to go bonkers in the middle of a math lesson so that we can escape. So that's what that speaks to. So D4 wants us to be thinking about how are we designing our environment that creates more self-regulation and self-control and independence on the part of the child, right? We spent a lot of hours talking about just this. Um, one of the things that I could probably touch upon that, that we haven't really looked at um, was some of the evidence of different self-monitoring tools. So we can do really good with behavior tracking sometimes and reinforcement. And then we can miss the opportunities for students themselves to be monitoring their own behavior, taking their own breaks, doing that sort of thing, self-monitoring. There's a lot of cool, easy, low-tech ways of doing self-monitoring. There's amazing, amazing apps, right? They could do it for us. Um, we have our checklist. We also have some very simple things, like if we have a child who's supposed to be participating during a group lesson, right? and we have three of those rubber bracelets that we give out for card or something else that the kids are wearing anyway, every time they make a comment or ask a question, they move the bracelet over to the other hand. When the three are on the other side, then they've really done their part. They've met their criteria for participating, if that was a meaningful goal for that child for a reason within my classroom. So we just have to remember that things can be complex, or they can just be simple enough that the child could be like, OK, this is a visual prompt of something I'm doing, and it's just a way of counting. Incidents are tracked using the ABC data sheets to determine the function of the behavior and design effective intervention. We chatted about all of that. Um, just a reminder that there's friendly, or, there's friendly ways of doing that, um, that that won't be as time consuming, and you get, you get better at it. So um, data is incredibly important, important and tracking whether, data's, whether behaviors are happening is incredibly important. important. I'll tell you why. If the behavior I'm trying to um, minimize or get rid of is a tantrum, right? Or screaming, screaming and hitting, throwing whatever. I defined it much more beautifully, right? And it happens four times a day for an hour when I start. And then a week later, it's happening three times a day for 45 minutes. At the end of the day, do I see that that behavior is declining? All I remember is a lot of screaming, right? Yet it's really having an impact on the behavior. It's going down. So we really can't always trust anecdotally they had a good day, bad day, or how it was happening. We really have to be measuring it as closely as we can and jotting that down along the way. Corrective feedback is provided promptly and positively. Um, bless you. The biggest thing here that I would want to emphasize is reminding how powerful just what we do naturally is, how our tone of voice can change to be neutral. We do it anyway when we're upset. Right? Um, our proximity is an incredible prompt, right? So if I, clearly, if I'm, I'm talking over here and I tend to go over here, I could be sending a prompt to this section that I'm really kind of more in tune to what's going on here. As teachers, we naturally have some of this as we're walking around the classrooms. It's just being mindful of how, what our feedback is and purposeful in our feedback and monitoring our verbal behavior, right? The way we speak to others and using it to really clearly especially with children with autism, right? The subtleties, right? Um, if, if you look at the, some teachers, the children don't get sarcasm or the difference between enthusiasm and anger. All of us have different modes of expression. Our, our verbals, our expressions, they don't always communicate the same way. So we have to be really careful in what our faces look like and what we sound like to send the correct message and then making sure that the child got that message, right? Um, not to belittle any child either, but when you're training a dog, right? If the dog goes to the bathroom inside and I say, no, 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 don't do that. Or I say, oh, good boy, good boy, you went outside. It's the same thing to the dog, right? I have to be very careful in rewarding, and that's where we have the treats or no treats, right? It sends a direct message, that's what I'm looking for, that's what I'm not. And we have to remember that with children with autism that also have some of that nonverbal confusion at times. 
Okay, individualized behavior intervention plans are developed and utilized across environments. Um, the main thing to be thinking about this is that we're implementing it everywhere, right? This is what I do in your classroom, but not in math, right? Oh, I do that in lunch too? So when we're talking about what behaviors look like, it really means everywhere. And that's tricky. That's certainly tricky, which is why it has to be written down and explained and in clear language so that if I walked in and I had to implement the plan for a week, I would be able to do that without a team of professionals explaining it for four hours, right? That, that's what we need. We can all get better at that, um, but that's certainly incredibly important. Making sure the materials are accessible to all, ouch. If I am a teacher and the only reinforcement is a $4,000 um, game that's in one room, that's not going to be the most powerful thing in the school setting to make this work, right? I need to be able to have access to it. Okay, so that was a very, very general overview of a lot of those behavioral principles that remind us of why some of this stuff works and why sometimes it falls flat. Um, these are evidence-based procedures. They do work with every child or human being because they're based on human behavior. Where we go wrong is when we fall apart on some of these, right? And we could all help each other out a little bit about that. So defining and teaching behavior. Um, so here's our turn and talk. And we have our giveaways. We have our volunteer giveaways. Or did they go to lunch? And... Ah. Awesome, awesome. OK. So let's take a little time to talk. Why don't we think about, you know, I, whenever I, anybody was talking about behavior, I'm always usually picturing one child in my mind or two children in my mind. So if you have a child that perhaps that, where there was a problem behavior, take a minute to think about what the function might be or what a replacement behavior for that could be. That's, that's a good question. So I will restate that. So the question was, and, and we'll probably answer that in, in a few different pieces and, and invite some to. Is a behavior chart that teachers do in class considered bribery? So let's go revisit what we were talking about in terms of reinforcement and bribery. What distinguished the two? The when, right, right. So what's happening on the behavior charts? Which one's in specific? If you get your work finished, you can move up a color. OK, fine. Do I move up the color before I finish my work? Or I move afterwards. OK. So it wouldn't be bribery. It would be reinforcement. What happens when I move? The lollipop until after. Go ahead. They get the no, lollipop good. after. So what's the difference? They don't get the lollipop till after their work is finished? So tell me, wh why do I care about moving up a color? Because it makes mommy and daddy happy. Makes mommy and daddy happy. That's my reinforcement? Well, then that's something that we have to talk about. Some of the things that we can talk about in terms of reinforcing behavior is if the behavior happens at school, ideally we're reinforcing at school. If the behavior happens at home, ideally we're reinforcing at home. The closer reinforcement happens to, be, to behavior, the more connection I make that my behavior was directly connected to it for one. That being said, there's all different kinds of situations in which we are making this work and negotiating. So the, quest, the first question of whether that would be bribery, my answer would be no. My answer would be that the reinforcement happened after the behavior, contingent on the behavior. My question would be whether I understand that going to green, what that means. That I understand that the behavior you were looking for me is what made me go to green, right? So if I moved on green because I had a good day, has anybody ever, and if you did, wonderful, had a really good day? Like literally from the minute we wake up, every step we've made, every choice we made has fall under good or bad? Not really. It's not likely for a student either to have a good or bad day. When we're talking about behavior plans or behavior charts, and we're all guilty of this. This is not a, we're doing this all wrong. It's just being mindful and improving this practice. Is I move to green when I walk in and sit down and do four of the problems that I was asked to do in that, right? I'm not saying that that's exactly what's appropriate. Now I understood that. Because the difference is, and we're all in different cognitive 
abilities and all of those pieces. The difference is I could have just walked in from recess, slapped a kid, and then I moved up from green because I did math four hours ago. Now, am I able to connect my behavior to moving up to green to going down? Right? There's nothing wrong with celebrating a success with home. So if moving up to green is, is powerful for me because it makes mom happy, there's nothing, or dad happy, there's nothing wrong with reinforcing that. Um, but what we're talking about a little bit, like moving to green, is it's signaling something went well. It's labeling a behavior, right? Token economies, those are, you know, the sticker charts. The, um, the, we'll talk a little bit more about that here. They're, they can be incredibly powerful. They're pretty, they're useful. Um, there's also a lot of science behind it. All of this stuff has to go in just right. Criteria, what I'm earning, I need to understand that what I did was connected to it. I have to know its currency for something later on. Think of all that understanding and self-regulation that I have to have. Very, very powerful for some students. Some students can't manage that at that time, right? So the most important thing is I'm labeling the behavior as it's happening, as expected, or as, as the reinforcement behavior that we're looking at. And that that green is truly reinforcing to me and has some secondary reinforcement. I can be on green all day. What does green mean? mean? Green means the praise. And for a child who can delay that gratification and for a parent who can guarantee that response, because what if mom just had a, you know, got a car accident on the way and then it's green? So those are the things that we have to be mindful of. But very, very good question, because when we talk about these in simplistic terms, it's very, very tricky, right? Great question. Thank you. Any other questions or comments or discussions? I'll give Marlene a chance. She is a runner, though, so she's pretty good. Um, in our school, to make sure that we stay consistent with um, all the students' behavior plans, we make behavior summaries. Um, and each student has their own clipboard. And in that summary, we make sure that their target behavior is defined. Awesome. Um, we break down their replacement behaviors, awesome. their correction procedures. Um, and we make sure that it's defined in terms that the staff will understand. As teachers, we understand kind of the, the terminology, but the staff may not. Sure. So we just make sure that that's clearly defined. Um, things that you should know about the student. So basically, anybody should be able to come in, sit down and work with that student, and know their behavior plan and what to look for and how to, how to deal with the student's behavior. Awesome. I love it. And user-friendly. Yes. And did you initiate that, or is that something that um, like a school-wide thing adopted? Yeah, we school do it school-wide. Awesome. Yeah, the whole awesome. school does it. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? We have a few, few more giveaways or anything? Yes. and buy different things. <laughs> awesome. Sorry, did I not give the, the, the mic a chance to get there? Can I, repeat, can I rephrase that for you? Yes. Um, so she was saying that when she was on uh, trying to teach the concept of money, how, how many do we get caught up with that? Money and time, right? We're there all day, all, all, all of our lives, right? And instead of using the colors that she had assigned the coin value, right? And so they were able to earn the, the, the money, which is a very real life skill, right? To apply, to buy. Secondary reinforces the stuff that they earn, right? Awesome. How much more likely am I to be wrapping my head around the concept of a value of a coin when it has a direct value to me, an immediate value, right? So we label things, we quantify them, but if I start to learn a quarter really got me more out of that store than the dime, and I know how I got it, right? That part too. Very powerful. Awesome. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Wait for me. Oh, I, sorry. Working off my lunch. Yes. We have online participants, so we want to make sure they. I have something to say about the um, non-contingent reinforcement. Okay. That saved my classroom. Okay. I'm because going. I had a student that would hit about 49 times a day, and we reduced it drastically to 14, and then at the end of the year, it was basically once a week um, if he did hit. And I had to learn how to be as excited for his just standard behavior as I was when I was alarmed. So I had to be like exaggerated. Wow, you put your book bag away and just start from there. 
and then easily faded out, you know, but it was so hard for me to get to be so exaggerated to get that behavior not to happen. Yeah, thank you. Such a good point. Such a good point. One of the reasons why we're so good at acknowledging negative behavior is because it's thrown into our world when we're trying to accomplish something, right, as teachers and parents. It's incredibly difficult to remember to acknowledge a behavior that's not calling attention to me because it's not supposed to. It's not designed to, right? That's incredibly, really um, um, insightful. Thank you for sharing that, for sure. Um, sometimes, or in my experience, this is where our team teachers, our paraprofessionals, where we all really came in to collaborate and help best. Remind me three times that I have to catch them. If they're doing it, make sure I'm acknowledging it. Because it's really hard to be thinking math at the same time as are we thinking working over here. So it's really how we can use each other with behavior management um, is incredibly important. Thank you. Awesome. Anything? Good? OK. You guys are good. You're troopers here today. It's a long day of a lot of information. So the, the last part of under the behavior that we we're going to chat about is the consequence systems, right? The ones that we're talking about here, how complex, how meaningful are they are, and what do we do to make them work the best for us and for our students in our classroom? So a visible reinforcement for appropriate behavior is in place. I chatted a little bit more for, but one of the challenge, most challenging things is it's not only if I walked in a room would I know whether the child, what, what the child was earning, how much they had till they earned, what they needed to do to earn is incredibly important. And that's what that visual support piece is. The fact that it's visible is incredibly important in measuring where I am. That's the real self-regulation piece of it, right? This is a behavior. This is a contract we're creating between the teacher and the child. That's pretty much what we're doing here. And it's in writing. Um, a thing about the token economy boards is we set a specific criteria for it having to do with a particular child. When we are doing, let's say we are doing a, um, a token economy board that has like 10 squares that we are checking off or we're providing that visual reinforcement of some object or, or character or something that they love, the number of boxes that are on the token economy should be the number it takes to earn, right? So if I have to raise my hand five times to be earning whatever it is, a walk from there, whatever it is, then the boxes should be represented of five times. So these things are really highly individualized for the child because it's a visual reminder of what's left. If I'm a child who can only self-regulate and do something for two to three minutes, and I see 15 boxes, it doesn't matter if beforehand you said two to three minutes because time is a really strange concept. It has to represent on that visually exactly what it is. So that when I would walk in, I'd be like, oh, look, only one more hand raise, and then you're going to be earning blah, blah, blah. More importantly, if I have a child who is verbal, which is what token um, economy boards are really, or somebody who can or understand, the child should know what they're earning, what earns, and how much they have left. So if you ask the child, they should have those answers right there. And if they don't, it's either not as clear as it needs to be or it's not as powerful or meaningful as it needs to be. Okay? okay. So I jumped ahead of myself. The specific criteria is set, and all students are eligible to choose an earned reinforcers that are individualized. We chatted about this up front so much, right? Um, some things like a school store where there's a whole bunch of different things to choose, that's individualized because I do have options. Um, but if everybody is earning extra recess, and I hate recess because um, social time is difficult for me, that's not a reinforcer for me. If everybody can go pick out of a, um, a treasure box and I don't really care about anything that's in there, then that might not be reinforcing for me. So that doesn't mean I have to create in a dynamic, fancy, you know, reinforcement for every single child, but I do need to know which children are not reinforced by certain things, and I need to make sure that the, the those are available to them, and that the criteria is specific to the child um, that's earning as well. Because we can do whole class earning, but we also have to be mindful that we're all at different places. Okay. The intensity, frequency, quality of reinforcement meets the level of complexity and effort required for a given task. Um, so there's a reason why we're paid every two weeks, right? Um, we if we were going to work and they say you're going to be paid every five years, 
we might have what they call a post-reinforcement pause, right? There's a little scientific thing that right after we're reinforced as human beings, we tend to stop responding for a little while. That's something we do naturally, okay? Um, so it's, if I'm asked to do 15 items for a high five, is that going to be as reinforcing? No. Just being really mindful for the child and for the task that the intensity matches a little bit closer. That's another way that we kind of fall apart on that sometimes. Specific behavioral praise is provided at a rate of four positive to one corrective statement. The, best, the most important thing here is to really look at that spe specific praise, right? Um, if I walk in and I just say, wow, you're a good teacher, and I walk out, I'm like, well, wait, what did I do well? What was it specifically that I do well? We're all here in the same room with this ASD tool because, not, because there's development in all different areas, and there's very specific things that we might be doing well, right? So we really need to make sure that our language says exactly that. I love the way you walked in this morning and you hung your backpack up right away. Look at you, you already have free time to go sit down and talk to your friend. That type of very specific. Not, you're so good today, or um, I really love how you listened today, right? It'd be more like, I really noticed that when I asked you a question, you answered right back and it made me feel so good that I knew you were listening. We have to be very, very careful with that. Um, we also want to be careful of not saying stuff like, you did a great job. He didn't, we say this, he didn't even hit anybody today. We do that, don't we? We remind them of what they normally do wrong, or they're like, oh, hmm, why not? What did happen? Why didn't you? Maybe tomorrow. That kind of thing. So we just have to be really specific in the language that we use for that, right? And we're all guilty of that. A hierarchy of consequences for inappropriate behaviors in place. Aha, we just learned that consequences could be good or they could be negative, right? But what we're really just saying here is um, know that there's different responses for different intensities of behaviors that are going on. Um, sometimes when we get into the higher grades that we sometimes have some more prescribed um, punishers for certain types of behaviors. And this indicator just says, let me look and make sure that some of the responses I am to make behaviors less likely to happen in the future, there's a continuum of them, that I'm starting some places, that perhaps I'm, I provided corrective feedback or a chance or a loss of privilege before there's a child that is, I'm adding to in school suspension or something along those lines. The teacher tip there is watch out for accidental reinforcement. What's that? What's accidental reinforcement? It's right there in the name. I accidentally reinforce that. We do that all the time, right? That's that teacher example I gave you. I'm not going to answer you every time you raise your hand. We can't stop our class every time you shout out. Those types of things. We accidentally reinforce. Or go ahead and sit in the hallway until we're done with math because you can't stay quiet. Great. <laughs> That's where I'll be. <laughs> Oh, pivotal praise. Are we familiar with this one? That could be really powerful. This goes along with that, um, let's say as many positive as you can for a corrective. That can be hard. I think if our children count, some of our children with some problem behaviors count how many times people say their name in a day, usually end with stop doing or a directive, I can only imagine how many times. I have to go blind or, excuse me, deaf to hearing it, right? So pivotal praise is a um, very effective technique that instead of pointing out a behavior, like I don't really like the way you're talking right here, that we work, we move to a peer that's sitting next to them, and we provide very specific reinforcement for what they're doing that's the opposite of the person next to them, right? So I really love the way you're sitting and looking right up next to me, right? That means this child's paying attention to me. It means that child cares that I'm gonna come over and go, oh, look, Allie's sitting so nice looking at me, too. Thank you, Allie. So I just saved one opportunity to not say, Allie, stop talking. I'm sort of saying, oh, I'm really, you're really sitting nice and quietly. Well, that's really great. That kind of thing. So pivotal praise is just one way to help that out. Oh, my God, you'd think that. I know. Okay. I, I went backwards again. Oh, my goodness, people. What were you doing here? Okay. Sorry about that. Uh-uh. I needed some teaching of this clicker. Okay, so that's going to go for her next. Oh, I finished. Wonderful. Okay. 
One thing I wanted to just talk about uh, here is, is the students demonstrate challenging behaviors that they're calmly reminded of expectations and redirected to pre-taught strategies. So any of us working with children, if we have an acting out child, a child who has acting out behaviors where you know things can go bonkers a little bit quickly, uh, most of us come up with these plans right away because it's survival. But we also have to be mindful that at any given time, we can have a child that's acting out child. We have to be aware that if we're teaching self-regulation skills or we're teaching a child to be able to calm down, that that has to be taught at a time when they're not in crisis. So if the only time we're saying, go to your calm down chair and read your social story about breathing in and breathing out and then we'll solve the problem, is right after the behavior, we don't learn then. It's almost as if I'm walking in from work, I just drove on 95 for an hour, I walk in, and he said, this is the time I want to teach you about how to load the dishwasher, right? It's just that it doesn't work that way. We need to teach skills at a time when we're calm and we're able to practice them because we're creating routine and memory in doing that. So if I have an acting out child and I need them to be taking calm down steps, they need a place to go. They need to know how to get there. They need to know what they're doing there. They need to be reminded calmly of what that looks like and how to get there. And they also need to be practicing that and being reinforced for practicing doing that when we're calm. That's a really important thing. So I know they spoke to that a little bit in terms of designing our classrooms, but just a mindful thing that even if I'm not acting out, but I'm just getting overstimulated, or I'm going to need to be removed, not in a timeout, but from stimulation, that just thinking that there is a part of, the, of a classroom where a child is able to go and that there can be, although supervised, a little bit of independent action going there that helps me calm down, right? Sometimes that's a visual social story of a reminder of what that looks like. There's something. So that's just an important thing to add to different behaviors for sure. OK. So we are pretty much, we wrapped up our behavior section. That's all you ever need to know about behavior, and you're good, right? <laughs> no, not at all. So we will remind you after this of, this is such a broad overview of so many incredibly rich, complex things that we try to do in our classroom. Um, CARD, we, you have your professionals within your own community. Some of you are professionals that can help each other out as well. But just know that this is a broad introduction. These are things to be looking about what we have in place and what we need to work on. And definitely rely on those that are, are more competent in certain these areas to help you build up some of this, because this is not easy stuff, even if it kind of looks like it when we're chatting about it. So definitely want to think about reaching out um, to, to those who can support us in implementing those. So we do have, are we, are we done with our giveaways? I think we are, right? Uh, any questions or comments or any insight, though? OK, so that's a little bit of a loaded question, but it's a really good one. So the question was, um, I've, we've talked about timeout chairs. I talked about having a little bit of a safe like de-escalation, calming down kind of area. And the question is, in my opinion, what is the best way of utilizing a calming space like that? Is that correct? OK. And why it's loaded is it's really hard to answer that question directly because Every child and the purpose would be different. What I would say is decide what you're using that space for and be consistent in doing so and make it accessible to others in the class. So if I'm going to positively introduce a calming down section, right, that is available to anybody who's just not feeling just right, I might even say, when my voice starts to get up, I start to notice that I'm just feeling a little too stressed out and I have to step away. Or when my, behave, when my hands are starting to get a little bit, I know that I need to stop. So if we're going to choose to use that as a, as a positive break area, then I wouldn't use it as a punishing area. Okay? I would also likely have um, some of the stuff that self-guides me into what behaviors of calming down looks like. Anybody who's been nervous or anxious or angry knows that calming down is a choice of a sequence of behaviors that we do that eventually get us there that doesn't feel like it's going to in the beginning, right? It means we stop, we walk away, we breathe deeper, 
We walk slowly. We stop talking. I look through a picture thing. I don't want to use it to send somebody out of something, and they're on the iPad, right? I don't want to use it as a reinforcement, per se. So I would say choose what you would be using that space for. Set it up as a practice, positively introduced thing. Teach the use of it. Reinforce children for using it appropriately. And make it available to not just one child. Make it available to an entire classroom community if that's what you're going to do. If we're going to be using time out in that same way, then we're going to have to be thinking about what does a structured timeout do and just being careful of whether it follows a behavior that it might be reinforcing because of its escape or if it's just something. And each time I would be using it as a neutral redirection because the idea of something like that in a classroom would be that it's, it's, it's semi-independent. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions or comments? No? I'm on the spotlight. All right, well, thank you very much. Like I said, we are available here. Thank you. To provide more support. Um, I also want to let you know that there are behavioral tutorials on the CARD website that give just 15 minute quick synopsis of some of these things like token economies and some of the behaviors. So you might want to check that out. Um, and I think we're just going to take a, a, quick, a quick 10 minute break, walk around, stretch, get chocolate, um, use the restrooms, and then when we come back, we'll just finish up with our last part. Please remember to stop by the Teach Town table, our sponsor. And also upstairs is Brooks Publishing with um, books that might be helpful in your classroom. Thank you. This kind of reminds me of a lot of my education as a child, right? That kind of sitting at the desk, independent work, pencil and paper, everything's really one dimensional and kind of flat, right? Didn't really provide a lot of opportunities for us to move around, to actively participate in the activities. And it kind of, well, it was kind of boring, right? And if I'm bored, what am I more likely to do? All sorts of stuff that we would consider undesirable, right? Because I'm not being challenged, I'm not being engaged. And so I'm gonna, you know, maybe fuss at my friend next to me or spitball at somebody or flip my chair. I mean, I don't know, anything, right? Because I'm just totally disengaged in all of this. But here we have on the left is kind of really exciting, right? So it looks like, just from my observation, it looks like three kids. So like a really small group of kids is working collaboratively to build uh, a three-dimensional shape with really unique materials, right? It looks like it's some dried spaghetti and perhaps some marshmallows, right? Kind of taking it off the page and into real life and challenging them. How would we go about creating this? What would we do? And I'm sorry, I mean, they're smiling. They're excited. This is fun, right? So it's this whole idea of kind of providing a different um, mode of instruction. When I was looking at this, I was kind of reflecting back on my days when I was teaching pre-K ESE, right? A pretty challenging group, right? Short attention spans, you know, maybe we're working on some potty training, we got all sorts of stuff going on, right? But one of the things that they always taught us, and we had to be mindful of when planning, was that we needed to alternate between passive and active, right? We can't expect children to be sitting for long periods of time and just focusing in on us talking in front of the room or, or kind of um, looking at a board. So we had to alternate. Now, depending on what level of student you're teaching currently, that might look different for you, right? You know, for us with the little ones, we would have circle time, and then maybe we would take them outside for a little bit of a break. But as students get older, it needs to be appropriate for that level, developmentally appropriate. So you 
should have students at some point sitting at desks, right? We're not saying that this type of uh, learning on the right is terrible, but it shouldn't be all you're doing, right? Because this on the left is really exciting. It gets them up, it gets them moving, it gets them talking, all things that they probably wanna do anyways when they start getting bored, but you're channeling it in a way that's functional and appropriate for the classroom. So the other element of this is instructional pace promotes high rates of responding, right? So not only do we want to provide opportunities for them to actively engage in the, in the lesson, but we really want to give them a variety of ways to respond. So again, on the right, we have that classic classroom experience, right? I'm sure some of you had this growing up as well, of everyone sitting at the desk. You ask a question, raise your hand to answer, right? And you had to wait. Well, if I never get called on, I'm getting kind of frustrated, right? It's not as exciting of an experience. And on the left, we see that she's got a small group of students, right? She's working on a lesson on meal plans. She has the real food in front of her, and they're actually able to manipulate the objects, engage, answer. They're probably it's a more conversational style as opposed to raise your hand and wait to be called. So kind of by offering different opportunities for students to respond, it keeps them checked in. Right? So there's different ways we can do that. We can do things like on the left, we can take a poll of the classroom, everyone raise your hand, right? We can do different things to try to keep them engaged in the process, have them write things up on the board, not just that standard raise your hand and answer the question. It keeps things fresh, it keeps them engaged because they might get called on, right? Or they might be asked a question, so they have to tune in. So Noelle is gonna come up here and talk a little bit about this element, reciprocal questioning. So for when we're talking about curriculum and instruction, we just wanted to throw a few of those tips in that actually help with some of the instruction where some of our kids get tripped up, right? So besides behavior, when we get requests to go into general education settings, what do you think are some of the things that we get asked for help for? I'll tell you, academically. Almost always. How do I help reading comprehension? How do I help written expression? Almost always, right? Because those are some core deficits that you know manifest from some of these other challenges. Asking higher order questions. Thank you, exactly. Making inferences. Oh, well, where were they? I don't know, the book didn't say. Of course not, we have to think. What was the picture? What season was it? What could they be? Where have you seen presents before? Oh yes, it was Christmas birthday, that kind of thing. Absolutely right. So we're still learning what evidence-based practices for intervening on reading comprehension looks like for children with autism. We're getting there. One of them is reciprocal teaching, right? This back and forth of taking turns, asking questions, and being in the teacher-learner role. Reciprocal questioning is taking text, asking questions, and having a student answer it. Some have to be higher level, right? Who, what, where, when? OK, I have that in the text. Why, how, ooh, that takes background knowledge. That takes putting information together. That's tricky. Reciprocal questioning has teachers asking questions, having kids answer, and then supporting the kids in asking them questions about the same material. We have to scaffold that for some of our children who have difficulty framing questions, maybe a visual of what is, where is, or for those who are able to put it out there, they can ask their own questions. So this isn't just to create engagement in activity. There's actually a higher level of thinking about material when we have to formulate our own questions about it. And then the answer by the teacher reinforces the knowledge and the information. So this is one of those, and I'll talk about another one in a few minutes, that really speaks to um, increasing reading comprehension in children with autism, children in general, but one that they're really seeing can really help with children with autism. Okay. Do you like our little tag teaming? That's how we keep you engaged. We keep switching in and out. OK, so moving on. We're talking about instructional methods that reflect the unique needs and are research-based. So we're talking about technology here, right? And so when I was thinking about this slide, I was remembering um, a student of mine who was super averse to writing. Do you have any students that are averse to writing, right? Just, just a couple, right? Yeah, just a few. So when you think about that, right, I always try to think of like, why? Why are these students um, averse to writing? And what I was thinking about is a couple reasons, right? 
probably one. Maybe they don't have the fine motor capacity to hold the pencil or the pen or the, or the writing instrument, and it's hard for them, right? They don't have the requisite skill. Two, um, I don't know if you've ever had any kids like this, but it is the, I have to get the letter perfect, and if it isn't perfect, I am going to stretch it out until I can get it perfect, right? And now I'm perseverating on getting that one letter perfect. Meanwhile, the whole class has moved on, and I'm stuck on writing my name but I know that I'm stuck and I can't make it different. And so now I hate writing. This is the worst day. I hate this and I don't like this class. And then, you know, it just kind of snowballs from there. And then another is, is sometimes children have kind of, um, maybe they weren't diagnosed yet, right? Maybe no one knew that they were on the spectrum. And so they were really drilled on writing, right? That whole idea of practice makes perfect. I remember writing things, you know, a hundred times and all of that when I was young. Sometimes that can lead students to kind of really have a negative experience. And there's a tendency with um, individuals on the autism spectrum that one experience can kind of color all of them, right? So if I, I went to see a doctor, and maybe they weren't really nice to me, all doctors are bad now. And you might have a hard time getting me to go to another one. So recognizing that with some students, there's something that happened prior to when you met them, right? Before, before they ever met you, that's gonna make them a little bit less likely to wanna do something. So we have to provide them alternate opportunities to produce, right? So this student I was thinking of, he would tell these really elaborate stories, right? But the way we were assessing it was by writing. And I'm thinking, well, there's got to be a better way to do this. He, he just has all these wonderful things to say, but in no way, shape, or form is his grades reflecting it. And so they gave him a device where he could type, right? They gave him a device where he could type, and all of a sudden, these wonderful stories that he could tell me were now the product by which we could assess, right? So it made sense for him. So kind of recognizing that based upon the students' specific needs and where they're at, providing technology that can meet them there and allow them to produce, to be assessed in a similar manner. This is all of what we've been talking about all day, meeting them where they're at, making these modifications and accommodations for these students. Okay. Students with varying rates of learning are provided individualized, differentiated levels of instruction. So this is essentially the individualized education plan, right? This is what that document provides. It provides for them for specific learning goals, objectives, and all of that. Because it, just like I recently said, the idea is, is that if we meet them where they're at and we make goals based upon that, we can increase their learning gains across settings, moving forward in their educational experience. And so talking about the role of the IEP, um, there's a difference between accommodations and modifications, right? And so accommodations are the same standard, but with a change in timing, formatting, setting, scheduling, response, and or presentation without altering what's being measured, right? So it's the same thing. So for example, if I have a test and it's 50 questions, right, in any subject, the accommodation might be every 15 minutes, the student gets a five minute break, right? They can complete the test, but they need to disengage for five minutes every 15 just to take a break, shake it off, come back and attend, right? That's the accommodation. Now modifications are changes to a standard or what the test or assignment is supposed to measure, such as completing work only part of the standard, right? So instead of it being on maybe a whole um, chapter or unit, it's a portion of that, right? So it's not the same as everybody else. It's modified, right? So instead of being um, 50 math problems, it might only be the first 20, right? So that's a modification of the original assignment. So why would it be important? The teacher tip at the bottom, it says, when, when possible, include the student in discussing accommodations and modifications. Does anyone have any ideas on why that would be important to include the students? Right. So the statement was, if anyone didn't hear that, is that you have to know what's going on in the student's brain, right? You have to know what they're thinking, right? Anyone else have any ideas? Oh, <laughs> Go ahead. Student buy-in, right? So we need to know what's going on in their head, what they're thinking, and also, if we expect individuals to participate, we need to give them buy-in, right? 
none of us like to have things done to us. Right? We like to be a participant in it, have some say, and then we're more invested in it, right? And even at a very young age, it's important to start this just to whatever degree is appropriate because at the end of the day, we want these students to be able to feel um, more independent. We want them to kind of plant these seeds of self-advocacy. It is so important that they start early participating in their education because at the end of the day, when all of us go away and they graduate, what happens? A lot of these kids are just feeling like, well, who's going to help me? You know, I, I particularly work in um, young adults, and one of the things I get a lot is that they just feel like services fall off, like there's nobody there for them, right? And a lot of it is because they've never been a participant in these decisions moving forward. So it really is important for a variety of reasons, not just the ones that we talked about here. So talking about core deficits, um, curriculum and schedule reflect an emphasis on the core deficits of ASD. So we can talk about the um, social interaction piece, right? Um, these skills, when uh, applied with adults and with children, right? We just don't want to teach them social skills with other adults, even though they might gravitate a little bit more to adults or younger peers. We want to also focus on working with same age peers. Uh, functional communication age-appropriate engagement, and maximizing independent functioning. So a lot of this has been discussed today, but it just recognizing that all of this is really important when we're planning and collaborating with other team members, our SLPs, our ESC coordinators, other therapists and staff, it's really important to include them all in this process. So curriculum and schedule reflect individualized instruction and supports in executive function skills. So does anyone know when executive function fully develops in neurotypical individuals? What age? 25. So an individual is not on the autism spectrum, right? And we call them neurotypical. Um, that's when executive function skills are fully developed. And executive function skills relate to planning, organization, the understanding of consequences as related to our actions, um, you know, managing ourselves. All of these things that we kind of require to function on an everyday basis, it's not really fully developed until 25. Now think about all the things we expect of students up until the age of 25. It's a lot, right? When they hit middle school, we expect them to change classes, to know what books they need in their bag for it, long-term assignments, high school, the same thing. So our expectations aren't necessarily in line with where they are in terms of their development. So we really need to, for, for all students, start planting the seeds of planning, organization, time management. But specifically with individuals on the autism spectrum, this is thought of as being an area of a, a deficit, a significant deficit. And so that's why we have students that we, um, they, they do the work in class, we never get the homework back, or we get a portion of the homework back. Right? They're not able to do it. Why can't you do the assignment? How can you have success in the classroom, but following through when it's independent? You can't. Well, that's part of being on the spectrum for sure. And so here we have some examples of kind of ways to develop it. And when we were talking earlier about visuals and schedules and all of that, that's planting the seeds for this, right? How many of you on a daily basis create like a to-do list? There you go. That's our visual reminder to us of what we need to get done. Because we recognize that our lives are busy. We have a lot going on. We might get distracted. And if we have certain things we want to accomplish, we want to make sure that we write it all down, right? And how do you feel at the end of the day when you check all that stuff off? You feel good? I know I do. Definitely. It's a sense of accomplishment, right? I said I was going to do it, and I did. So this is really what we're working on here. We're setting the expectations. We're helping them develop the skills that they need to be able to complete tasks in a timely manner. And so it's so important to start early. And as they get older and over their development, the way that these um, supports look can change, right? So by the time they hit high school, it might not be uh, a schedule with the pictures showing what classes they're going to. It might just be a regular printed schedule that everybody gets, right? It becomes less noticeable, but no less important. 
And Noelle's going to come back up and talk about anamorphic viewing. Okay, so revisiting the reading comprehension thing for a moment, okay, because we do get so many questions about that. Anaphoric cueing is just a very fancy name for the one thing we identify that breaks down in oral communication and in written communication with individuals with autism is what they call reference, right? Pronouns, small words that represent people, concepts, that can really break down and think about how often we use them in speaking and how much they use them in text. So one of the interventions that they find works when you're really targeting reading comprehension or oral comprehension is to take the time to explain what each um, pronoun or referent means, who it's referring to. Really start the child or the reader to be actively thinking. When they say we, who are they talking about? Name the characters and really start thinking that. Or in language, when I say I, when I say you. In, in text, sometimes they actually, for some of the older children who are, have the ability to do so, they might have them go through a list and actually write down what they mean underneath it and then reread the text for comprehension. So NF4Q is just an instructional strategy targeting reading comprehension that tries to speak to the deficit of the reference or the pronoun confusion that some um, readers with autism can have and really increase the comprehension by just taking out that abstract piece of it. So that was just one instructional tip to speak to that as well. Okay, I'm next to. Okay, so we likely are using these. It's just a reminder based on what Allison was saying, a mnemonic device is anything like we see here that gives us a quick little jazzy way of remembering in order <clears throat> or, a, or a list of things that we are responsible for knowing how to do. Mnemonic devices are, are shown to be an evidence-based way of reminding people um, to create a structure or a routine to something for things that are hard to remember. Around writing, we do this a lot. For those who have writing routines and are in different advanced writings of um, levels of writing, something like a COPS, capitalized, organized, punctuate, spell check, tells us, oh, there's an editing process. It happens when I'm done or continually. And there's certain things I'm looking for in an order. And it speaks to the executive functioning piece, right? So to go back to the function of the behavior, that was a mnemonic device. The word was seat, right? So what were the functions of the behavior? Seat. Sensory. <laughs> Escape. Non-BCBAs. Attention. Tangible. Immediately we're able to recall in this quick way because we're thinking of it in terms of order. So that's just mnemonic devices. Whenever we can introduce them, there's so many cool ones on the website to remind us. Um, just to be, keep in mind that it is an evidence-based practice of kind of triggering a routine. Still me? Or you? Okay, so the next one talks about data are collected, data are, data collected for each student by all staff across activities and settings. And so, um, you know, we get these IEPs, right, with these goals and objectives and everything, and we know what we want to look for. Um, and how do we measure it, right? How do we measure what is written down that we need to provide updates on? We collect data, right? And I, and I love stuff like this. I love collecting data. I'm really into all of it. And it's really important to recognize that there's um, different ways to collect it, right? When I was teaching pre-K, we had um, a couple options, right? So there was kind of the more subjective ways to collect, right? So we would take anecdotals, right? So if I saw a student doing something they were supposed to, you know, so-and-so came in, they put their bag down, and they went and sat for circle time without prompting, writing it down, right? I'm making a note of it because in that moment, it's important for me to capture it so I don't forget it, right? And these are all things that can lead to informing your summaries later on. So there's those. And then there's the more objective forms, right? So we have a couple charts here that are looking at specific skills, um, an academic checklist, and one for play. And these are just little tick marks, right? We take this so that we can kind of track and have information. Um, because when we look back on things, sometimes it changes, right? We forget that someone did something. So this is a really clear way to kind of track. Um, so talking about the first part. So these are the variety of ways you can do it, right? across settings. So it's important to not just do this in the classroom, right? Because sometimes the goals are written for behavior specifically in um, PE, right? 
or behavior in the lunchroom, right? So we want to kind of be able to understand what it's looking like in different settings. So we want to be able to try to capture it in the different settings. Um, and then also by multiple staff members. Why do you think it's important that multiple staff members be involved in the process of collecting data? More objective and... Are you talking about inter-rater reliability? <laughs> yeah. Well, think about another thing. Say, for example, I'm the person in the classroom who's collecting data all the time, right? I'm in charge. What happens if I get sick and I'm out for like a month, right? I get really sick and I'm out for a month. What happens? We've lost a month, right? And also, what if, and sometimes this happens, what if this one particular child kind of stresses me out? <laughs> let's, let's be honest. <laughs> We've all had students that particularly kind of, you know, triggered us a little bit, right? I'm not as accurate on my perception of situations, right? I might be less likely to acknowledge a positive occurrence because I'm feeling stressed out. Um, for example, when I was teaching, I had kids that would like hit me, right? So you, it's hard for you to separate yourself from that if you had a negative experience, right? So it's important to have multiple sets of eyes on things. And also throughout the school day. So what if I'm only collecting data from 8 to 10 a.m. every single day, right? What happens? Any ideas on why that might not be the best strategy? <laughs> the day is long. Yes, the day is very long. <laughs> yes, sir. Right? OK, it's not really reliable. Anyone else? What if every day I have a student who, after lunch, melts down? But I, but I don't know for sure, because I just know I've never actually collected on it, but I just know that he has a tendency, right? If I'm not collecting, if I'm not observing, if I'm not paying attention to this period of time, I'm missing. Maybe he's eating something at lunch that's causing him gastric distress. Perhaps he's nonverbal and can't tell you, my stomach hurts, but every day after lunch, he's melting down. He's crying. If I'm not paying attention to this, and if this isn't something that I'm acknowledging, I'm missing it. Children behave differently. Students behave differently over time. After lunch, after recess, it's important to kind of capture all of it throughout the course of the day. I see you guys laughing in the front. Do you have a story? <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like you have a story about that one. <laughs> She's like, not that it would be appropriate. Well, thank you. <laughs> OK. So appropriate choices are offered within and or across tasks. OK. So here's this idea of giving choices, right? So we give students choices for what reason? Why are we offering them the opportunity to make a choice for themselves? To have control, to have ownership, to have buy-in, right? Just like making, um, asking them regarding their accommodations, we want them to give us information. We want them to start patterns of behavior that we want them to continue for the rest of their life, right? If a child's whole life, things are done for them and they're never asked, what do you want? They're not going to develop necessarily the skills to advocate, to say, I don't want that, or I don't like that, or please don't do that, right? So giving them the choices are, is, is really important to kind of plant those seeds of, of self-advocacy moving forward, right? And so there's different types of choices we can give them. So which materials to use? Do you want to use the blue pen or the black pen, right? Um, between things, do you want to go to, you know, the safe space or do you want, you know, giving them things like that, right? Um, partners, locations, when they want to take a break, do you want to take a break now or in five minutes, right? Snack or not, to keep going or finished. Here's the cool thing about choices, right? It's really important to do this, but recognize you as the adult, um, you're never going to give them choices that you don't like, right? So we kind of do this little trick with little kids where we say, do you want this or this? I like both of those options, right? I selected them. You don't really know that, but I'm letting you feel like you have some control by still me having some control, right? So it's kind of like that interesting little dance we do with kids where we give them the opportunity to make a decision, but we like both outcomes, right? So 
we need to be prepared to honor these choices. You never want to give them an option that you don't want them to accept. Because if they choose it, you need to let them do it. Because what happens if I give you options and when you choose one, I say, no, 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 you're gonna do this one instead. What have I just done? Taking it all away. I'm telling you that regardless of what you want, I'm still gonna tell you what you're gonna do. It's pointless. You might as well not even bother, right? And then you have to be prepared to follow up with the next step. So you have to follow through, you have to kind of build upon that, and as they get more competent and older, you know, these choices become more part of their everyday life. So Noelle did, oh, there are actually little bins where they sit in it with blankets. I know, I was fascinated by it. It's like the coolest thing ever. They look like they're little cars. Interesting. People get really creative with this stuff, so it's really cool. Noelle did a really great job talking about safe spaces, right, and how important they are and, and how they're utilized. And you guys had some great questions about it. Um, the one thing I would say about safe spaces is that, um, yes, it's important to kind of um, not introduce them in a moment of, you know, panic, tantrum, meltdown, all of that, right? We don't want to do it then. Because then I'm not ready to hear you. I'm in my brainstem, I'm fight or flight, like I'm not about to hear any of that, right? The other thing is that it's just like any other area in the classroom. Right? If you're setting up workstations, at the beginning of the year, I'm going to teach you how to use it, just like it's any other area in the classroom, right? I'm going to teach the whole class how to use it. What do we do in this safe space? Why is it important? Because I can't expect you to understand how to use it if I didn't teach you. Um, thinking about the safe space I had with my little ones, I don't know if any of you are familiar, you might be, uh, Becky Bailey and her conscious discipline. Is it not the best thing ever? Yeah. So to this day, I still do star when I get, I was doing it over here earlier. So, you know, you have all these little visuals of ways to decompress, right? So there's the star, it's a picture of a star, and it's an acronym for stop, take a deep breath, and relax. Right? You'll be doing this later, and I promise you it works. So, you know, you have this great little picture. You know, they've got the draining. They've got, um, what's the other one? What's another one? Pretzel, pretzel, right. She's got all these great visuals, right? So I have those in my safe space so the kids could see it, so they could choose what they wanted to do. And it was a visual reminder of them, to them, sorry, of what we do in that safe space. And it was great. So again, the safe space, it's important that you teach how to use it, right? That everyone can access it, but it's also not going to be some place where I go play, right? I want to be really clear about what this is for. So I'm not going to be dragging the blocks over or dragging other materials over to the safe space because I want to really honor what this is um, for what it is, right? So yeah, the one on the right, I have no idea how they created it, but it's, I kind of want one, so... Okay, curriculum accommodations are differentiated to meet student needs. And so again, this statement really just encapsulates what we've been talking about all day. A variety of formats, across settings, with this idea that they can access the general curriculum. And this is kind of how it's done, right? So over here, we see content, right? And what that means when we're talking about accommodations is, is the curriculum the students access and how they access it, right? The process element is related to how teachers sequence the learning and the ways in which students learn, right? The product is how they demonstrate what they've learned, right? So just like that little guy I was talking about who was able to type out his answers as opposed to writing it, right? The product can always look different. And the environment, how that learning is structured. Susie talked about that a lot this morning, about how much care and consideration goes into the learning environment and how it's structured, and how that really contributes, ultimately, to student participation, success, and experience. And here's another kind of cool visual on how I meet kids where they are, right? So some students, we can just go through on the left side, straight down, right? We introduce the topic and then we assess, right? They've attained mastery, and then we go through the enrichment. Most kids, I would say, it's probably a little bit more of what it looks like on the right, right? We introduce it, we assess. We acknowledge that there's probably some gaps, some holes, right? So then we move into alternate ways 
to teach it again, right? So we're going to do small group, guided practice, independent practice, assess again, right? And if they've hit mastery of that topic, we'll go to the enrichment phase. You might have to go up and down a few times, but seeing the visual of how complex it is, it kind of puts it in perspective for you, that it's not just like a one-off, right? Again, if you can tell, I like visual. Um, this one's really cool, because this talks really about where we're at in terms of our own mastery. And like, considering today, for example, right, we've given you all this information, all these different domains, this tool, a lot of talking and stuff. Some of you might leave today just in the red, right? We're going to remember it, right? We're at the kind of basic. Or some of us might understand it, right? But understanding that there's a trajectory up based upon times that we practice. So maybe later on when you guys look at this tool, practice using it, maybe you look at the PowerPoint again, ask some questions, you can eventually get up to the top level where you're creating this for yourself. But recognizing that it's a process, it takes time, and a lot of elements need to be kind of in between the levels in order for it to make sense to us so that we're able to reproduce it on our own. And the last slide that I'm going to talk about is really important. Um, it's about transitions. <laughs> anyone have anyone that has trouble transitioning in your classrooms? Right, yeah. So when people ask me, you know, what do I do? I'm having a challenge with so-and-so about transitions. I just don't get it. Why aren't they able to get off this activity and switch to the next one, right? I always kind of paint the picture like this. So what if when you walked through the door today, you checked in, and that was it. You didn't get an agenda. Okay. No one told you where the bathrooms were, who was going to be speaking, what sections were going to be covered, what time we were going to lunch, what time we were eating lunch, where we were eating lunch, um, what time we were done. What if no one told you any of that? And then when we got up here, there was no PowerPoint. It was just one after the other, us coming and talking and walking off. How would you guys feel? Would you feel comfortable? Would you feel like you knew what was happening next? Would you be getting a little anxious, maybe? Right, right. A lot of our students, that's how they live. They never know what's happening next. People don't necessarily explain things to them. Maybe they don't think they'd understand. Maybe they don't think that it's necessary. But when we don't, um, when we can't anticipate and plan, it makes us feel really uncomfortable, right? And then when someone just says stop, move on, whatever, it might throw us off. So recognizing that a lot of these kids are kind of functioning in a place where they don't know what's happening next, and so they're very frustrated. Okay, and so that's why kind of really preparing students for transitions is so important. Letting them know what's going to happen over the course of their day with a schedule. Giving them prompts five minutes before an activity ends. Using visual timers. Using time timers. Giving them the opportunity to feel like they are an active participant in their daily experience in school. And that's going to let them feel a little bit more in control, right? Because we don't like that feeling. None of us would ever feel entirely comfortable if things just happened and we had no active control, or we didn't know. So it's important to kind of keep that in mind. Like Rosie was talking earlier, kind of having that sensitivity. Just having that sensitivity that for a lot of these kids, this is where they live, right? This has their, been their experience. And so they might be averse to transitions and changes. Um, and that's it for me. I'm going to let Rosie talk next about Safer, Smarter Kids, um, and then we'll do our turn and talk after. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm back because I've got a soapbox that I have to get on, and I have alert, in, plugged in educators that are all working with children who have special needs. So I want to make you aware, and since we're talking about curriculum, I want to make you aware of a really important curriculum um, for our children. Three out of five girls, I, I'm sorry, one out of three girls, one out of five boys are sexually abused um, before they graduate from high school. This is the number, nine out of ten, for children with disabilities. 
and you guys are our front line for defense against this. 95% um, of sexual abuse is totally preventable, and you know what? We've got a tool to help you do that. Um, safer, smarter kids. Um, it is a curriculum that is free to all educators. It is free to community groups. Um, it is um, based in Florida, um, out of the Miami area. It's a, um, uh, based out of Lauren's kids. It is a developmentally appropriate curriculum, so nothing too graphic, nothing that makes you feel uncomfortable. Five to eight 30-minute lessons. That's all it is. Kindergarten through 12th grade. Uh, it fits in with uh, state education standards. It's approved by DOE. There are no reasons not to do this curriculum. Um, it's not graphic at all. But very, what it really does is prepare our children to report something if something is going on that makes them feel uncomfortable or that they see. Do you have a question? Mm -hmm. Right. 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 Absolutely. And you know what? I'm a ther because I'm a therapist as well, and I've worked with children. 100% um, of my children are children with special needs. And when I heard this statistic, I honestly couldn't sleep. So fortunately, FAU card lets us spread the word about this. Uh, Lawrence Kids, Safer Smarter Kids, they will come to your school and train. They'll talk to your principal. They'll talk to faculty. It's an excellent thing for guidance counselors to do. Because even though it's 90% for kids with special needs and we're their first line of defense in this, the statistic is ridiculous for gen ed kids too. No children, no child should be sexually abused. So um, this is a very, very proactive curriculum. Did I say it was free? Because it's free and easy to access. They'll come and train you. They will come and sell it to your principals so that they get an idea of why it's really important. It is not explicit, so and it's developmentally appropriate. So it's something that you will feel comfortable teaching, um, because what it does is really teach the children strategies on how to what to do if something happens to them. I mean, it's amazing to me that we just don't talk about it. We say don't talk to strangers, but it's not the strangers that are abusing our children. So please. Um, when you guys check out today, these pamphlets are up by the thumb drives. So please remember to take one, look at it, digest it a little bit. Go onto their website. There's information for parents um, uh, as, as well as professionals. Um, and like I said, free, easy, um, put it on your, in your lesson plans, do it once a year, and, and you, you, it totally can be a school-wide kind of project. I think we're going to do... Um, no, come on up. Uh, turn and talk. Yep. So we're going to take a couple minutes to do the turn and talk to do the domain, complete domain three. So just a couple minutes from now if you guys want to start, and then we'll be wrapping up. Oh, um, well, basically kind of the elements, right, Rosie, the curriculum instruction, right, just the... Yeah. Oh, right. And so in the end when we kind of finish up, uh, if you guys would just kind of think of something that you want to give some feedback on, on what you thought was successful or some things that you are already doing in your classroom that kind of align with this that are successful. Okay? Yeah, you guys don't have to sit in your chairs. You can get up and move around and kind of take advantage of that if you'd like. Okay? As long as we get the language specific and consistent within all staff members and everyone that interacts with them, 
I think that that's probably the most clear way to do it. Um, does anyone else have any ideas about that or feedback of things that they want to share as well regarding that? Oh, sorry. Well, say, do you need to take a break or do you want to continue to take your turn and circle time or whatever it is we're doing? So whatever it is we're doing or take a break and 99% of the time he wants to continue with what we're doing. Sure. So, but then if he is out of control, he will go and take the break. Right, you're gonna prompt him to take the break. Right. right, you're prompting him at that point, right? Because he's not, maybe he's not ready to make that decision. Again, we talked about when I'm having a meltdown and I'm in that fight or flight part of my brain. I'm not necessarily able to regulate. Depending on the child and their, and their level of functioning, they might not be able to make that decision at that point. But definitely, choices, like we were talking about, are so important, right? Both choices you're okay with, right? They can stay or they can take a break. So we're not offering something that we don't want, but we're giving them some ownership and participation in it. So did that answer your question? Okay. okay. Anyone else? Just to add to that on a behavioral note, make sure you're you know, specifying with the behavior. Is it a calm space, quiet space, safe space? Mm -hmm. Same with hands. Folded hands, safe hands, quiet hands, because they need to differentiate. You know, does he need to be calm? Does he need to be safe? Does sure. he need to be quiet? So make sure the language is there following what kind of behavior it was. Sure. You notice that there's a lot of kind of emphasis on consistency, right? Consistency in language, consistency in that, because it just reinforces it. If we're saying a lot of different things, it gets kind of muddled. I have a safe place story that's a success. Um, I teach pre-K, ESE. And I had one little girl that we were working with, and I was modeling for her. I'm so angry. And I'd run in there, and I would do all the breathing, and then eventually she was doing it on her own. Now, here comes summer. They went home, come back in August. She went right into it. Well, I had a new student, nonverbal, very frustrated with communication, not being able to sure. get things out. He used it naturally just from her modeling. Okay. So now I have the older ones kind of modeling for the other ones, and it was just running, functioning on its own. So... That's that great. Cool. And you can see how it's so important to teach all the students how to use it, right? Because they're watching each other too, right? That peer modeling. You might not think that they're paying attention, but they're seeing it. And so if you teach everybody, you're really going to capture the most, right? And let them reinforce one another in a positive way. That's an awesome story. Anyone else? Sure. I'm coming. <laughs> Poor Marlene's getting the workout. I think one of the hardest things you talk about, consistency across the board, sure. not just language, not just curriculum, not just behavior plan. And as a therapist who comes and goes, I might be in the school and not back for a week. It's very frustrating to come in every week and find the plan has changed. Sure. I don't think we've given the student enough time. You know, And week after week, the plan has changed, the plan has changed, the plan. I don't think that's fair to our kids. I can't change that fast. You know, and I think it's hard to know as a team when to hang in there and when you've hung in there too long. Mm -hmm. But again, I think the whole team needs to buy into that. That's just a comment. Sure. Well, and, and, and that's true, right? So Rosie was talking a lot about how the, the teacher and the speech language pathologist really need to work in tandem. I think the whole team really needs to because these decisions need to be something that we all buy into, right? As participants in this team, we talk a lot about student buy-in, but as a team, we need to all buy in in order for these strategies to be effective. And it is very frustrating. And as a former classroom teacher, I'll say that it's really hard sometimes to be consistent, right? A lot of things come at you, and, and you just sometimes you're, you're not as great as you'd want to be. But I think if we're just kind of cognizant of it, we can try to be better, right? As soon as we can kind of say, like, eh, I didn't do the best today. I'm going to try harder. But it is hard, right? It's not, a, it's not perfect ever. Sure. There is research out to show that implementation fidelity is extremely important. So that goes along with that consist consistency piece. And the takeaway from that research is that, hmm, it's not him, it's us. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. You know, when we're the ones that are in control and in making these decisions, right, we have to acknowledge it's us. Like if I give a test to the whole class and they all fail, is it the students or is it the test, right? Sometimes it's hard to take that look, right? 
But absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. Anyone else? Okay, great. So thank you again. But I want to introduce um, Mary Ellen, I guess, is going to introduce Valerie for everyone. Thank you so much. We are fortunate tonight or today to have Valerie Herskowitz here with the Chocolate Spectrum. And so she has brought some of her product, but she's going to give you how many are aware of the, the Chocolate Spectrum? Great. Okay. She's just going to give you a quick overview, and she did bring some of her products. Hi, everyone. This is a little impromptu, so but thank you very much for giving me the spotlight here for one second. Just to tell you about something that's inevitable, which is that everyone here who works with children with autism are eventually going to have those kids grow up and be adults with autism. And unfortunately, that's probably one of the last areas that people such as myself and other professionals in in the autism world really thought about and now we're sort of thrown into um, a frenetic uh, catch-up of what do we do with our children when they no longer are in your hands but they're out in the real world. How many of you work with adults now or high schoolers? Okay. Um, thank goodness we're all starting to have the conversation. Unfortunately for some of us it was a little too late and I was in a position when my son aged out of the uh, school system here in Palm Beach County about three years ago. And I was given, you know how many options I had for what he could do after high school? Zero. He's, there was nothing. And I had spent two years really looking to see what we had here, what agencies could show me, give me something to do for him, and really was back in my lap. Thankfully, um, just as life has it, I happened to have just gotten myself into what I thought was my semi-retirement period of life, and I had decided I was going to become a pastry chef. Don't ask me why. I never really was into the kitchen, but I really was into pastries. And long story short, we got together, um, Blake and I, in the kitchen, and I became trained, and he showed an interest, and we started the Chocolate Spectrum. Um, as many of you know, I'm a speech pathologist and ran a therapy center for many years, and so it wasn't good enough for me just to work with Blake. We started bringing other fellows and young ladies in, and before long we had like 12 to 15 people coming to my house to make chocolate and other pastries. Um, then I realized this had to be a little bit more than a fun activity. I had to start thinking, it just not just for Blake, but I had to start thinking about where was this going? Was this just going to be recreational? Was this going to be what? And, and then I started seeing the unemployment statistics. Anybody see those unemployment statistics in autism? Okay, 80 to 90 percent of individuals right now who have, who are adults with autism, are either unemployed or underemployed. That's a lot. And I realized I had to be more than just a, an entertainment center. So I started saying, how can we change that? How can we make this a, an unemployment opportunity? And what that meant was I had to get out of my house. Because we have cottage food laws in the state of Florida that only lets you get to a big whopping $15,000 a year of income. That's gross income. Other than that, you cannot be in your home. So there's not a lot I can, a lot of, I can pay people at $15,000 a year of gross income. So we decided to start looking for an option of what we could do out of my house. And we went through a million different things, commercial kitchens, renting, whatever, and we realized we had to get go big or go home. And that's a silly thing for me to say because actually we have just a 900 square foot retail space. But for us it's very big. And um, we just opened up five weeks after five weeks ago after a very uh, anybody done construction in Jupiter, Florida? It's the hardest thing ever. And uh, we finally got it done. It was supposed to be a six-week project. It went six months. And is it, and I'm honestly, it's just a 900 square foot facility. But it's fun. We have a great kitchen. We have a, a, a retail space in the front. We have a cafe in the front that serves. Um, all kinds of coffee. Uh, what we did was we structured it to make it so that our people um, could do it. So everything is user-friendly. 
All of the equipment is designed for individuals that are differently able to be able to learn and use. And so um, right now I'm proud to say we have two, two fellows employed by the Chocolate Spectrum. We have one intern who's on her way, another few months, and she'll be employed by the Chocolate Spectrum. We are community uh, still has a long way to go to provide support for training. That's probably the next big piece. Um, I did everything for free until I started having rent, and now I have to charge for some stuff. But we're still moving in that direction. So I invite all of you. It's, you know where it is? Does everyone know where it is? It's right here. <laughs> it's like five minutes from here. If you go out, uh, if you come out of here and you go to Island Way and you get to where uh, Indian Town Road is, there's a shopping center right on the left, which is where there's a Winn-Dixie and a Duffy's and Park Avenue Grill and stuff like that. And we're right in there, right near the dry cleaners. So if you have a chance, come by. Um, if you want to come today, it happens to be two for one Tuesday, just saying. But <laughs> if you like cupcakes and chocolate covered strawberries, it's two for one Tuesday. But come by. Um, if anyone's, if you're have nothing to do tomorrow between 12 and 2. That's when all of our, our big group of guys gets together. And uh, you can the way we have it structured, there's a big glass window. So if you're in the cafe, you can watch us producing. We always invite guests to come in and take a look, um, see what we're all up to. So we have some treats in the, in the lobby if anybody wants a few treats. But um, come by. Thank you. It's great chocolate. I'm online. <laughs> we ship. That was how our. That was what our original business was for three years. Was an online mail order business. And I always told everybody, I will never, ever, ever do bricks and mortar. Never say never. Thank you.